So none of you have tried to kill me yet, so as far as I'm concerned, this is a better Vegas trip than my last one. So I, I wish I had that, that, that DEC2 gene because I'm so sleep deprived, I'm not sure if, if, if I'm actually tired or someone slipped me acid, and then I remember we're in Vegas, so either it could be true. I'm just going to take this off in the world's t most terrible magic mic ripoff ever. Uh, if you really want to see it, it's down the strip, so. Uh, sorry, that's it. <laughs> Now, won't be getting any tips on that one. So I'm going to talk to you today about something that a lot of you here already know really, really well, but I, I want to dig a little bit deeper on it. So we all say critical thinking is so important, and it is true, but how important, right? We're almost at the 60th anniversary of a very big thing. The Cuban Missile Crisis is what everyone thinks of when they think of the eve of destruction, right? When Khrushchev and Kennedy were engaging in frantic diplomacy above the waves, the real drama was actually happening under the North Atlantic. And there was a submarine called the B-59, which was being pursued by a, an American aircraft, not American aircraft, an American aircraft carrier, the USS Randolph. And the submarine had dived too deep to communicate with Moscow. And the Americans trying to get the submarine to surface decided it was a good idea to drop depth charges on it, uh, which is like if you're in a tin can and someone hits it with a sledgehammer, right? Uh, it was 50 degrees Celsius. I'm doing quick maths. That's 122 Fahrenheit inside the sub. They were running out of oxygen, high in carbon dioxide, and they were down to one glass of water a day. Not exactly situations conducive to good decision making. What the Americans didn't know is that there was a single T5 15, ki um, 15 kiloton nuclear missile on that submarine, which the independent uh, Soviet subcaptains could use if the political officer agreed. Now, the political officer and the captain happened to agree that war must have begun. And they were aiming, they were in the process of aiming this warhead at the USS Randolph. So, as you know, the history books don't record that well. They don't record us being blown up on that particular day. What actually happened is there was another gentleman, this very handsome uh, Russian fellow here. Uh, he's very handsome, isn't he? Vaskly Arkhipov, and he was the flotilla commander. And by sheer happenstance, he had an equal vote in whether they launched their warhead or not. And he reasoned, no, if we launch this warhead, we definitely start a war. We don't know if there's a war yet. I refuse to authorize it. It ended in a fist fight, but he won because he had just survived the famous K-19 Widowmaker disaster the year before, you know, when the sub melted down and they had to repair the reactor themselves. So he was fairly well respected. And look at those shoulders. I mean, I wouldn't take a fist fight against him. And I love the way a guy called Vasily Arkhipov saved the world, said Thomas Blanton. And this was described by Arthur Schlesinger Jr. as not only the most dangerous moment of the Cold War, but the most dangerous moment in human history. So that is a success of critical thinking that we're all here today in Vegas. Um, let's think about, I, I mean, I'm not sure if, if Richard's here, but I want to ask the world's most foremost evolutionary biologist to identify this bird. <laughs> Can some other people could identify it too. It doesn't have to. That is a, a, the common Eurasian sparrow. I just wanted to ask someone overqualified to identify common fauna because that's just that's my thing, right? Uh, this is not an Asian sparrow. That is a communist leader, just not to get confused. In 1950s China, uh, the communists had just won and wanted to modernize the country, or basically they wanted to ape the Soviet Union and bring um, a, an agricultural society into a modern one. And they decided they were going to get rid of all the pests. They were going to kill all the rats, Right, get rid of them because they vector disease. Mosquitoes, yep, makes sense. Uh, they were going to get rid of flies as well. And to that weird rogues gallery, they added the sparrow. Why? Well, they saw the sparrow as the bourgeois bird, right? Bourgeoisie, I think you say over here. Uh, because it was eating the farmer's grain without doing any work for it. So it became a hated animal of capitalism. So they really went to town on killing them. Uh, they would bang pots and pans so they couldn't land. They would break their nests up. They mustered a force in Beijing, uh, which was Peking at the time, three million strong just to go and do this. And within a year, they were super successful. They'd killed a billion birds. They'd made them extinct in China. But the ornithologists of the time kind of objected to this. Mao had them thrown in prison for objecting, how dare they, um, because they pointed out something. The main thing that the, uh, the, the sparrows ate, does anyone know what their main dietary treat is? Insects, particularly locusts. Uh, without, <laughs> without any sparrows, locust populations in China in 1958 exploded. In fact, they had to do a massive vault fast and import sparrows from the Soviet Union, but it was too late. By the end of a year, that was one of the disasters that led to the Great Chinese Famine that killed between 15 and 45 million people. And that's a good example of when critical thought becomes afterthought. Now, I do a lot on uh, you know, health, health disinformation these days, and just when we talk about what do people believe these days, I'm not going through all of these, 
but this is from a paper I did about two years ago. About 30% of Americans believe that COVID-19 was made in a lab, right? And that is roughly a third, that's about 100 million people in the country, right? Some of these other figures, 20% uh, believe that cell phones are causing cancer. 37% of people believe the FDA is covering up a cure to cancer. We will come back to that one later on, okay? Um, so we live in an era that we can't just say this is tinfoil hats. When I used to start researching conspiracy theories, uh, I had a BBC journalist say, oh, very exciting, you're talking about people who live in their mother's basement. And I'm like, no, I'm talking about your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, your brothers, and your sisters. And I hate to say I was right, but the pandemic was very good at disabusing a lot of people of notions that conspiracy theorists are some evil other. No, they're, 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 they've always been around. It was just more easy to be open about it. By the way, I saw this in the New York Times today. Disinformation affects politics as well. There's the Orange Goblin saying something terrible, no doubt. Uh, <laughs> does he have any other mode? Um, I know none of you voted for him, it's fine. Like, you know, you have IQs well over 100. Um, but this is a big problem, and it has been a huge one for, for quite some time. But I want to talk about how we go wrong, and then maybe we can talk about how we make it better, I hope, right? Um, so. I want to go back to an interesting time. It was 897, good vintage, great year. Um, but at the time, the medieval papacy made Game of Thrones look like My Little Pony, right? Uh, they are all into murdering each other, having a great time, and there was so much power. These days, they mainly you know, cover up child abuse and exploit money, but back at the time, they were properly killing stuff. And there was a very famous trial that happened in the year 897. And it was a current pope, Pope uh, Stephen the Sixth or Seventh, depending how you count your anti-popes. It was one of those times, a lot of anti-popes. Uh, he was putting his predecessor, Pope Formosus, uh, I'll say this in English, Pope Formosus on trial for nepotism and perjury and simony and, and, and fornication, all the fun stuff, basically. And he was thundering these accusations at him. And in a stony face silence, Formosus said nothing, just stared back at him. And he turned around to the jury and said, an innocent man would defend himself. The former pope has said nothing, therefore you must find him guilty. And the jury agreed, and they found him guilty. In Formosus' defense, he had been dead for eight months before the trial began. Um, and, and, and to be fair, what I love about this is Formosus in Latin, does anyone know what Formosus means in Latin? Handsome. <laughs> I, I have a feeling that at this point in time, he wasn't the best looker, or it wasn't the best moment of his life. They found him guilty. They cut off three fingers on his right hand and threw him in the Tiber so he couldn't perform any miracles. He was rescued by some monks, worshipped as a relic, and by the end of that summer, Stephen had been strangled by some of his closest friends. Like I said, Game of Thrones, you got nothing on this, right? Um, but this is a good example. That veneer of logic was obviously transparent and self-serving, but it seemed to make sense. That was a logical fallacy. Does anyone know which logical fallacy it was? Yeah, you all do. I, I, this is the wrong. This, I, I can fool students with this, but not this audience. But you could see the, the gap in logic. A lot of people miss it. And I'm going to give you another example of, of people missing it. We talked about this, actually, I think uh, Richard this morning talked a bit about this. The moon landing, 1969, right? We had something in the order of not just we don't just have copious evidence that it actually occurred. We also had someone in the region of 400,000 contractors and NASA staff involved in making this crazy idea happen, and happen it did. There's Buzz again. We all know this is Buzz because we were at the talk this morning. Um, it, it required a huge concerted effort, and yet somewhere between 6 and 22% of the population, depending on when you survey, survey them and what mood they're in, deny it ever happened. And the way they do it is a very interesting thing. You can show them all the evidence and they can refute it. And the way they refute it is with a fantastic jump in logic. Well, if there's a cover-up, the official reports, well, of course they'll deny that. The official reports deny there's a cover-up. Well, there's obviously a cover-up. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because the logical steps don't make any sense. By the way, this annoyed me so much several years ago that I did a paper where I looked at, you know, how long would these, if everyone did want to have a conspiracy, how long could you make 400,000 people keep a secret? And it turns out not very long at all, even if you make them better secret keepers than, say, the NSA. Uh, so that was, that was fun. It doesn't convince people, but we'll talk about why it doesn't in a little while. Rhetoric is an interesting thing too. I do a lot of, I'm obviously in the cancer research sphere, although I, I, I dabble in and out of different things these days. And one of the things that I get a lot when I talk to patient groups is this stuff. Hey man, cannabis cures cancer and the government don't want you to know. Um, and and it's, 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 it's really common. I mean, and it, it's kind of funny to us, but what's not so funny to me is when patients start, I work with a lot of patient advocacy groups, and it's not so funny to me when they give up their chemotherapy 
because some halfwit down the road told them that the government are covering up this thing. And what they say to me to convince me, when I, when I do talk to them, not the patients, I will never have a go at them, but the, the evangelists for this stuff, they go, do you know THC, which is the psychoactive component in, in cannabis? Do you know that kills you know, cancer cells in a Petri dish? That is absolutely true. THC kills cancer cells in a Petri dish. So does sneezing on them. So does water. So does bleach. So does accidentally putting the incubator at 36.8 degrees instead of 37 degrees by accident, right? Turns out it's really easy to kill cancer cells. What it's very difficult to do is kill cancer cells when they're inside a person when you don't want to kill their cells. Because let's not forget, cancer is a mutation of your own cells, right? We, we tend to think that any treatment that kills the patient as well, probably not ideal. Unless you really don't like the patient, I don't know. <laughs> um, so this, this kind of stuff, I want, where this really annoys me, by the way, the XKCD comic gun sort of always comes to mind. You know, when it comes, when, when you think they can kill things in a Petri dish, yeah, so can a handgun. I'm not actually sure if that's true. I have not done this experiment. We're not a big uh, gun country, and I haven't had the best experiences with them. Um, but here's one of the things that I did find. This is a paper by Skylar Johnson. Uh, he was a great guy, and his colleagues, when they were in, I think he was Yale at the time, and they looked at patients that went down the complementary medicine route, and patients that did not, and their survival over a five-year period, I think, here, or actually, she's longer. And these are Kaplan-Meier survival curves. I won't go too nearly into them. Some of you know them, some of you don't. But essentially, what this is showing is that patients who went down this route had poor long-term outcomes. And the reason why is they tended to delay or refuse their traditional treatment. And that is never ideal if survival is the goal. So I get really annoyed at these cranks and these scam artists who do this to patients because it is not harm free. It comes, and I think everyone here would agree that we've, you know, we're not just sitting here because we want to be right and we want to be contrarian. It's because this stuff kills people, right? Uh, and it, it causes all sorts of societal distension as well. Um, and one of the saddest things that I found is there was great talks earlier on that talked about scientists needing to reach out more and to make sure they're active in communication science, and I agree wholeheartedly. But one of the things that we've noticed during the pandemic is the notion of expertise has become a little bit fuzzy, right? Um, if I said names to you like Robert Malone, some of you wouldn't recognize that name? Robert Malone claimed he, he invented, or according to one report, he invented mRNA. So he invented something that has been essential to mammalian life forever. Good man, Robert. Yeah, good, good on you. But the problem is people like this, we, we all know Wakefield. Andrew Wakefield, I, I don't have to, obviously he was a fraudulent doctor who um, claimed falsely that the MMR vaccine, the measles mump rubella vaccine, was connected to autism. It was not, yet to this day, people really believe that. I've had the mispleasure of dealing with uh, Andrew Wakefield in person, and it didn't go well for, for, uh, for either of us or my mental health. He's an awful human being. Uh, Judy, Judy Makovich, I think, I'm pronouncing it wrong, she came up with a pandemic documentary. That was the number one, I say documentary with the inverted commas implied. Uh, it was the number one video on YouTube for a very long time. Um, and it had to get banned, but it kept getting reshared. This is terrible stuff. This woman you mightn't recognize, she's bigger in Europe, Dolores Cahill. She was a UCD professor in Ireland who became um, a COVID crank. These are just some of the ones I could mention, right? So, what happened during the pandemic, which is really interesting, is that we had a fracturing of expertise. So, for example, if you were very anti lockdown, you could find, say, some professors in Stanford who would tell you you were absolutely right. If you were more cautious, you could find other professors telling you the opposite. People started shopping, cherry picking, for the experts that said their stuff. And the very important lesson, and I wrote about this in Scientific American a while ago, it's not about what an individual expert says. A scientist is only communicating science when they are literally quoting the evidence. If they go off piste, their qualification doesn't matter one iota. They're no longer doing science. That is a very hard concept to get around to people because we use that kind of shortcut an expert is telling us the truth, that's a shortcut that we all use. It's a very understandable one. It didn't go well for us during the pandemic. So what's really important, I think, is that we need to get better at communicating what science actually is and why um, individual scientists coming out with absolute nonsense. They sometimes, call, sometimes they call it Nobel Prize disease. After Linus Pauling decided vitamin C cured everything, the only man to individually win two Nobel Prizes. Um, so, you know, no one is immune to this but it's very important to, to recognize the difference and the limitations of things. I also want to talk about the psychology behind this, because this is important, I think. So why do people become susceptible to this stuff in the first place? And obviously, 
we see this all the time. I mean, these are just some of the, the, the COVID stuff you see. Um, the 5G people are uh, having been harassed by them for a very long time. They're an interesting group. If I had more time, I'd go on a rant about that, but I won't, don't worry. Someone asked me in the bar later on, I'll give you good stories. Uh, but this, there, there's something underpinning this. This is not an information deficit problem. I think Lee said that in his talk, and he's absolutely correct to, to most of this. There's something deeper about it, right? So why do people believe in conspiracy theories, for example? Or why do people fall victim to this stuff, right? And one reason is epistemic certainty we crave understanding the world around us. We want to think we get it, right? We don't want to be sitting there faking our way through this. So conspiracy theories and these false narratives give you a sensation that you know what's going on. That that's your sense of well-being. This makes people feel comfortable, all right? You can see why this becomes alluring. You might not understand all the complicated science, but if someone says, nah, it's all a conspiracy, that's a simple us versus them narrative. That is less complex, more alluring, right? The other thing is aversion to randomness. We don't like the fact that the world is very, very random. It's uncomfortable. You could argue that all of religion is founded around that principle, right? We prefer to believe that someone is in control, that someone knows what's going on. It is perversely easier for some people to believe that Bill Gates or George Soros engineered a virus, then to accept the fact that spontaneous evolution of you know, a previously non-particularly pathogenic uh, virus can lead to all the chaos that we saw. It's easier, it's more reassuring. It doesn't seem like a more reassuring narrative to me, but it seems that way to a lot of people. And finally, and I think we really need to make this point, egotism, right? What does egos have to do? If you look at the kind of people that perpetuate conspiracy theory, now I am making a distinction based on what Lee said earlier on, there's a difference between people who fall victim to conspiracy theory and people that perpetuate it. The ones that sit there and, and do the loudest thing, uh, or, or even the Joe Rogans of this world that will literally let, let on any crank to perpetuate it, that's not necessarily motivated by the same things that we're talking about here. Egotism is interesting, and we've seen this during the pandemic, right? It's a powerful motivator. Everyone knows about Alex Jones, who's just been, well, how, a billion? Was it a billion that was awarded? Fantastic, good. Couldn't happen to a nicer person. Although I, I still, I, usually in the longer version of talks like this, I do one, the, the clip, you know, do you ever see the one about the frogs? They're turning the freaking frogs gay! Uh, it's, it's wonderful to watch. I'll put it up on Twitter at some stage. And he starts slamming the desk. It's so performed, it's so contrived. And you wonder why five million people were listening to his show. I don't get it. Russell Brand was once a kind of lovable, cheeky, chappy comedian, and is now his most unbearable and evidently narcissistic person you could ever listen to. Um, he's got a huge podcast. He's got two of them now, I believe. And obviously, Naomi, uh, Naomi Wolf, who went from being a relatively respected author to something very interesting. I actually found a tweet uh, just from her. I'm just going to use it, because if, if, if Neil was here, I'm not sure if he is. It will annoy him so much. I wanted to share it with you. So let me read this. Terrifying. Also explains and confirms the conversation I overheard in a restaurant in Manhattan two years ago in which an Apple employee was boasting about attending a top secret demo. They had new tech to deliver vaccines with nanoparticles. Maybe she's from Boston. She's a Southie. I don't know. That let you travel back in time. Not kidding. I don't even know where to start with taking that one apart, if I'm honest with you. So I'm just going to tell you that's wrong and hope that you'll take me on faith, right? I don't even need my physics training to tell you that's wrong, but it, 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 the nanoparticles is my favorite thing, though. I just, it's brilliant. All right. So what do these two people have in common, by the way? This is Princess Diana. This is Osama bin Laden. Please don't say style icons. I mean, particularly not the latter, right? What do they have in common? Any ideas? Hey, someone got it. They are both the subject of extraordinary amount of conspiracy theories that think that they are alive but also an extraordinary amount of conspiracy theories that think that they are dead. And the people that believe one tend to believe the other, right? Like there's some kind of Schrodinger's Bin Laden that's existing in a quantum supo state of being alive and dead at the same time. Um, and there was a study done by a friend of mine, Karen Douglas, where she got conspiracy theorists both over here in the US and in the UK and got them to read narratives where Diana had been killed by the Queen. <laughs> God rest her soul. Um, and, or that Diana had faked her own death. And conspiracy theorists could believe both at the same time, right? And the great title, Dead and Alive, Believing in Contradictory Conspiracy Theories, it's a great read. It's, it's open access, I think. And one of the things I love about it is it showed that really the motivation wasn't understanding. The conspiracy theorists didn't want to understand the world. They wanted to feel like they knew something more than you. 
So if you think that logic is the reason they're going to go there, disabusing them with logic is not going to be enough. Uh, I also love this one, by the way. I give this to my students sometimes, so I'm going to give it to you, right? Year on, year out, cancer rates go up. And if you go onto wellness Twitter or wellness Instagram, you'll find all sorts of reasons. It's the fluoride, it's the, uh, it's, it's the vaccine, it's the 5G. Right? You look, that is quite a substantial increase in cancer rates. Does anyone know what's going on? Anyone want to volunteer something? <sighs> yeah, you, you are an audience that takes the fun out of this, you know that? A hundred percent. You haven't met anyone who died of cholera lately, probably. Although I was about to say, you would have met anyone who died of measles lately, but unfortunately, well, things go up and down, right? Um, infectious diseases before the pandemic, when I originally wrote a slide like this, infectious diseases weren't as big a killer because we kind of got them under control. And then COVID came and destroyed my talk. Thank you very much. But it is a point that we are living longer. And perversely, um, our increased cancer rates are a symptom of improved societal health, right? This is one of my favorite quotes by, a, by, a, by an Irish countryman. Newspapers are unable seemingly to discriminate between a bicycle accident and the collapse of civilization, right? <laughs> Uh, and why would they? But one of the things I love is sometimes when you're getting very riled up about something, you've got to ask why and where and what's the source. We all know the stories that COVID was, uh, was engineered. That, that became a very quick conspiracy theory. I think the first time I recorded it when I was writing about it was literally the first day the New York Times had covered it. And by the end of it, there was a conspiracy theory about it, right? And then we found it from the European Commission that China and Russia had been backing these stories. They'd absolutely been encouraged them. They'd actually been sometimes seeding them. And you might go, why? Well, let me tell you something. There is nothing new under the sun, right? These aren't even new things. In 1981, when AIDS was first recorded, right? Uh, it first happened in, in, in New York and Los Angeles. Uh, it was originally called gay cancer informally, then it was GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency, and eventually AIDS. And the Soviets thought, great, you know what we'll do, the KGB? We'll have a bit of fun. And they came up with this, AIDS, a man-made disease, and they ran it in a few of their plant papers, you know, mystery disease created by US experiments. This was the infamous Operation Infection, or Operation Denver. There was two different things of it. It was very successful. People panicked. It was pure disinformation. It's the exact same thing they did with COVID. Right? The joke was on the Soviet Union long term, though, because AIDS was very, very real, and it came to the USSR, and they were years behind on their biotech research for a lot of different reasons, which I won't get into today, um, and they had to come to the USA for help, because <laughs> the USA had been dealing, the CDC did sterling work, and if you ever read Randy Schiltz and the band played on, fantastic history of the, of the AIDS pandemic, and really worth reading, but um, the back channel agreement from Reagan was, okay, we'll help you if you stop spreading this rumor. They apologized for it in 1992, but they obviously didn't learn much from the apology. So there we go. So, but what happens is content that scares us, content that outrages us, stuff that makes us mad, sad, or scared, we share that a lot more. And it polarizes us. It creates these echo chambers people go into. So social media, not necessarily a net force for good. I don't think I'll surprise anyone with, with that stance, right? But we need to talk about what we can do to, 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 to dim that down a little bit. So here's some of our favorite people. Everyone knows Joe Mercola, big fan of him. You know, the cancer epidemic is a dream for big pharma and their campaign to silence cancer cures of being fierce. Ah, we've heard that one before, Joe. Maverick cancer treatments are suppressed by the mainstream. And I wrote a piece a few years ago, it was, uh, it was The Guardian or something, it probably was The Guardian, I can't remember what it was. And I basically criticized this particular body, the Alliance for Natural Health. Um, and I'm gonna explain why I criticize this state, because this is really common when I deal with patients, right? They, they've, they've heard this stuff and they're scared and they become susceptible to, to nonsense, right? Uh, they wrote a nice hit piece on me. I don't know where they got this picture, but it was wonderful. But they think, and they were supposed to insult me. They said, he's young, he's hip, he's got cool hair. And I think that was supposed to reduce my credibility, but I actually had that printed. I wanted t-shirts of it, um, because no one has ever been that nice to me before. Uh, and they, they said, skeptic, I've joined the UK Skeptic Knights, Brian Cox and Simon Singh, and very nicely, Brian Cox did actually welcome me. We had a secret handshake. It was fantastic. But let's just, let's, let's play the, the Socratic method on this, right? Let's break this down. Let's not just dismiss it as something obviously silly. Let's play devil's advocate, right? Let's take premise one, that there is a hidden cure for cancer. Well, here's the thing. We need to think about that. Cancer is not just one disease. Cancer is a family of over 210 known maladies, all united by irregular or strange cell division, but they're all incredibly different. You don't treat a thyroid cancer the way you treat a pancreatic cancer because the cells from which they, from whence they came are very different. I think I just I can say whence. I don't have to put the from there. Um, it, it's a very different thing, right? 
Um, so why would you expect a single magic bullet to work for all of these? So that's the first big question I would, I would ask someone who says this to me. That's the first thing I'd ask them. i go, what about that? The next thing they'd say is, well, there's no money in a cure. If you cured cancer, big pharma couldn't make any money. I'm like, oh, oh contraire, they can make a lot of money. If you can cure a disease that half the world will get, you're going to make money, even if you give it away for pennies, right? But the other thing is, they go, well, they can't because it's natural, it's, it's THC. Yeah, we can. They, they, they bioprospect all the time. If you find the active ingredient, you synthesize it first, you prove it works, you make all the money, right? If tomorrow we found vitamin D really cured cancer, every pharma company in the world will be scrambling to find out exactly what concentration, exactly what they could synthesize, and exactly what they could sell. So that's wrong. And the final one they come back to me with is, well, cancer rates are being manipulated. We're being given cancer. Does anyone know who this is? Yeah, exactly. Sometimes called the, the, father, the father of medicine, right? He was describing cancer about 3,000 years ago. Because if you let a skin tumor grow too long, it starts to poke out through your skin and it looks like little crab legs. Hence, cancer. We don't let that happen anymore. That's a big no-no now, right? If your tumor is poking out your skin, something's gone wrong. Anyone here speak ancient Egyptian? No. Well, you're going to have to take it on faith that this is an article by Imhotep describing the removal of a breast tumor, and that's over 3,000 years ago. So cancer is an ancient disease. We're just living longer and getting more of it. Similar thing, and I won't go into this, the Wuhan lab leak stuff has a similar thing. If you take apart every beat of the story, it just doesn't work. Uh, pandemics arise in nature all the time. You don't need to make human intervention. That's not a better explanation. It's a worse one. Uh, you make bioweapons and they backfire. That's why people stop making them. If China made this as a bioweapon, it didn't do them a lot of favors. If America made it as one, it didn't do them any favors either. So this is the Occam's razor, the finest razor we have. It doesn't add anything and it takes more. So as a wise physicist once said, the first principle is you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. Um, so just to sum up, I'm going, to do, I'm going to do one more slide and then I'm going to finish up with something, right? So some things to, to question. If we hear something, does the logic make sense? Does it follow? Does one premise follow to the other? Are we being misled by emotional rhetoric or bad framing? Um, are our own biases playing in? Because that's a big thing. And are someone else's biases playing in? Uh, if we're talking about numbers and stats, are we comparing like with like or are we missing something, right? Um, are our sources reliable? Something that came from, I don't know, the New York Times is probably more reliable than your racist uncle's Facebook page. And we need to know that. And finally, like, are we following the scientific method as it's meant? But before I, I sit there, and we all, we're all skeptics, and I'm telling an audience, I am preaching to the choir here, but we actually want to make the world a better place, and I really feel we do. And I love this quote from, from Voltaire, which is, love truth, but pardon error. Because remember, a lot of the people you will deal with who believe these strange ideas are victims of these ideas, right? In 2013, in Japan, the HPV vaccine, which by the way can prevent cervical cancer, uh, came under a sustained attack by anti-vaccine activists. Uptake dropped from 70% in one year to 1% the next year. It came to Denmark the year after. It went from 79% uptake to 17% in a year. And then finally in 2015, it came to Ireland. We had 87% uptake, and within a year, it had gone down to one. And there was, oh, sorry, sorry, gone down to 51, not one. That would be very bad. Um, and there was a lot of stuff. Uh, now, I was involved in communicating a lot of this at the time. So I came out there, and the Irish government did something very clever and proactive, which is rare I say that, but they did. They got a bunch of people like me, and scientists, and doctors, and trusted parent groups to produce literature and, and fact-finding services that would kind of neutralize this a bit, reliable sources of information. And that started to help. That brought the number back up the next year to about 60% uptake. And then we stalled. We hit a hard ceiling. We could not get back to where we were. And the anti-vaccine activists were growing strength. All of these so-called side effects, by the way, were, were myths. And they just didn't happen. But we had a, a secret ace that no one else in the world had at the time. We had this woman. Laura Brennan uh, was diagnosed with terminal cervical cancer when she was 25. And she had been too young to get the vaccine. And she had been following this in the Irish media. As she knew that she was, this, this cancer would take her life, she was watching people not vaccinate their daughters. And she contacted the Irish Health Service and said, what the hell, use me. Now, it happened that she was charming and, and media savvy and, and beautiful. And she said this, I'm going to read this quote. And she said this to parents. At 24, I was diagnosed with cervical cancer stage 2B. I was quite optimistic as there, something could be done. With chemo and radiation, there was a good chance it could be cured. Two months later, it was back, and things are different this time. There is no treatment that will cure my cancer. There is only treatment that will prolong my life. If anything good comes out of this, I would hope parents get their daughters vaccinated. 
the vaccine saves lives. It could have saved mine. Laura was yeah, a phenomenal person, and I had the pleasure of working very, very closely with her. Under her steerage, she disabused the notion that people were afraid of what might happen. They weren't vaccinating their kids because they were scared. She was showing them what they really should be scared of. She, you, you don't get through to people's heads unless you get through their hearts. You gotta get past that first. Uh, she did absolutely incredible work. She, she died at 26 um, in 2019, but now in Ireland, the vaccine uptake up rate is over 90%. And yeah. <laughs> And she's told me she'll haunt me if I don't always mention that as well. But um, that, the WHO now use her story as a case study. So just to finish up, some thoughts on changing minds. There is no shame in changing our minds or giving other people the freedom to do so. There's only shame when we refuse to do so and the evidence permits. We are not our ideas. We should be promiscuous with our ideas and abandon them when they no longer make sense, right? We should alter them when required. And we never change anyone else's mind. You've never changed anyone's mind. You've given them the tools to change it. No one's ever changed yours. They've given you the tools and freedom to come to your own conclusions. They've planted the seed. And that's something to remember, even when we get frustrated with people, plant the seed and just hope that reason wins out. I'm gonna stop here. If you wanna read more about me, this book is out there and uh, Richard said very nice things about it and he can't take them back now. So um, I'm gonna stop there, but thank you so much for listening.